home for 24 hours, that an unregistered wizard set magical beasts loose in New York? Yes. Where is this man? So, you're the guy with the case full of monsters, huh? Use travels first. Mr. Scrander, do you know anything about the wizarding community in America? We don't let things loose. Hey, Mr. English guy, I think your egg is hatching. You wiped his memory, right? The no magic. The what? No magic. The non wizard. I'm sorry, we call them muggles. I don't think I'm dreaming. I'll give it away. I ain't got the brains to make this up. Something is stalking our city. Wreaking destruction. And then disappearing without a trace. Witches live among us. We've lived in the shadows for too long. I ask all of you, who does this to protect? Us? Danger. He senses danger. This is related to Grindelwald's attacks in Europe. This could mean war. We got a plan, right, guys? They need our help. Was that everything that came out of the case? I won't let another one die. I refuse to bow down any longer. Time is running out, Mr. Commander. Give it up for the cast. Um, this movie is so is so wonderful. I know that a lot of you haven't seen it, and I'm trying to get you to see it because they're here with me. But I truly did love this film. It's so delightful. All of you guys are so much fun to watch on screen together. Did you? Did any of you know each other beforehand? Because it seems like you're all having a really great time, except maybe for 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 you, Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> on screen, that is. Wait, it didn't seem like I was having a great time. Because your because your character is 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 a bit morose. Oh right. Yeah. yeah no, no 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 that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah good point. I was having a good time though. Uh, talk about working together. I, I don't think we I don't think any of us did know each other. I we once met. bumped. Uh, they met. Oh do you remember Ezra? Ezra has no memory of it. it was yes. Really a great meeting. Yes I remember meeting you certainly. And you? People reincarnate. Whoa. <laughs> People. People reincarnate in clusters. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we all knew each other. Yeah, that's a good point, Dan. Gosh, that's I'm so valid. I'm hurt. You don't remember this, Ezra? What? It, I had just gotten the part, and oh, Ezra hadn't been cast right. yet. But and I didn't really consider that before. Yeah. That was like that was in the midst of it. That was when I was I was after the role. But did you know I was in the picture? No, it was announced the night after I met you. Yeah, okay, this is actually a good Brilliant. story. Good. We didn't know each other, is the quick yeah. question. <laughs> that is the story of Fantastic Beasts. Thanks so much, guys. It's been I a bet, pleasure okay, having so, you. So, Eddie, we met at the, we did know each other kind of, we met once at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. True, that is true. We, in fact, had really, we were at a, a film festival with a really rigorous, good 40 minute interview. And so I knew a lot about Ezra, but it was a lovely bonding moment, actually. Yeah, because we both got so heavily upstaged by Elle Fanning. Exactly. <laughs> because she's so much cuter than us. She is so much cuter, <laughs> more talented. But yeah, Catherine, we met and seemingly <laughs> randomly when I was after the role. And then I went home and was worried about whether I was going to get the role or not. So typed in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And the announcement was this person, in my mind, random person who I'd met six hours ago, had just been cast in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. That was weird. That goes with Dan's uh, life cluster Hi theory and stuff. Bum -ba 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 -ba. Does that sound as weird as it does to me? <laughs> it does, right? You guys are messing with me. <laughs> 
You guys are messing with the muggle. Uh, Eddie, talk about getting getting this part. It's a it's a huge undertaking. This project. It's it's like what five movies, right? It's it's going to be four or five movies at this point. No, I think I think that's that's J.K. Rowling's plan. Right. Um, but we when we all read the script, um, it was just this uh, one movie. And one of the things that I kind of love about the film is that whether you're a Harry Potter fan or not, um, it stands alone as its own kind of entity. And um, when I first heard about it, I had a really top secret cryptic meeting with David Yates, the director, um, in a club in London, and it was Christmas time, and it was raining. club? Yeah, in like a private members club. That Not he like a club in of. the States. They have <laughs> okay, yeah. I wasn't I dancing to Rihanna. I have this great part. I'd love to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to tell you about. So <laughs> fitting for this. Yeah. Rolling. David Yates, mild-mannered director of the Harry Potter movies in a <laughs> house club in London talking about Fantastic Beasts. Talking about Fantastic They got a bottle, bottle <laughs> service, <laughs> and the firecrackers. Did Diddy <laughs> happen to be there? Was like... <laughs> Um, no, it would. Uh, I, I, that would have been an amazing, a much better story than this one. It's the point was, is he started telling me this story that because Joe was writing the script at the time, and it was about this guy Newt and his case, and I had a case that I that, that looked kind of like Newt's that I used for work, and I didn't know anything about the story when I walked in. But as he was telling me about this case, this case in the film, my case was sitting here and I started sort of gently pushing it back because I looked like that guy that turns up dressed as the character. Which, yeah. by the way, we've learned in some of these other interviews that Dan Fogler actually is that guy. And, and now I feel really offensive when I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, want I don't want to be the guy that wears to the, the forefront. <laughs> I don't mind. I'm Darth Vader right now. <sighs> Does it sound weird out there? They Someone gave, give me another mic. They gave the you the God. alien filter. It's good. Work, work okay, with it. Okay, forget it then. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I should give you this mic, and then, and then we do the... Uh, do I sound like Stephen Hawking somehow? Hello. <laughs> that would be strange. Ha. Huh? No, you can't do that in front of Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I feel like we're all friends here. I'm not doing a Stephen Hawking impression. <laughs> He, he got an Academy Award. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't possibly. That would never work. What is in, what is in, your, <laughs> what's in your case? This so you have a case that's similar to Newt's. In Newt's case, he has, uh, the, he has the Fantastic Beast, or he has sort of decoy uh, notepads and ties and stuff. Yeah. Sort of center. What's, in, what's in your what's case? In, my case is filled with really um, boring things. Well, it was filled with really boring things like... Um, scripts and notes and things and now though I I I then had this real dilemma because this is a case I use in life and now when I'm traveling I'm like do I take the case with me because now people are going to think oh you were cast as Newt's commander who has a case and now you walk around with a case like going okay. method you know yes. and but I did I decided I was going to use the case and I on this press tour I bought my wand with me <laughs> And Where's just, the wand? Well, the wand, it was in, it's in my case, but I just brought it because I felt like it would be reassuring to have Newt's yeah. wand on the case. But then it got, we got through coming through customs, and I suddenly realized that a wand looks like a really sharp, scary object. And then to try and explain to a customs person, <laughs> I was like, have you seen the... No, anyway, so that was a bit disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, uh, talk about your character. I play poor Pentina Goldstein. I feel like whenever I talk about her, I get her accent a little bit. She's got, I'm from New York, but she's got a slightly thicker accent. Plus, it's more fun to say poor Pentina with a little bit of a New York twang. It's but like a 1930s sort of New York accent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she uh, is, was an auror at Makusa, which is the Magical Congress of the United States of America. And uh, right before the film starts, she's been demoted at work because she, uh, she broke a rule. And so she's kind of, uh, at the beginning of the film, she's kind of desperate to get her job back because it's, kinda, it's the area of her life that makes sense to her and works, and the rest is kind of uh, stunted and underdeveloped. She, uh, she, doesn't have a, she doesn't attract a lot of male attention. Uh, she doesn't have any boyfriends or anything until uh, this dude shows up. And so... Newt's commander. Yeah, he kind of... It's a little bit of a... Her vibe in the movie is a little bit of like a how Porpentina got her groove back kind of vibe. <laughs> so I think would be a great title, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a, it's she's, a... she's like, she's got a tough outer shell and, she, and it's kind of a front because she's kind of... 
nervous about her career and insecure on the inside. It's a much different tone uh, for you as an actress than I think we're sort of used to, used, used to seeing you in, in the last few films. that I've seen you in Queen of Earth and Inherent Vice. What was it like for you sort of changing into a kind of a more irreverent and uh, delightful tone? Uh, fun, nice, you know. It, it, it was so exciting to get to do a movie that, you know, my whole family could watch and... Uh, and not be like traumatized by being flashed by me or something. Um, and, uh, and and it was also just so much fun. You kind of think with films like this that y you might have lots of prep time rehearsal to work out all the stunts and everything, and sometimes we did. But sometimes we'd get to set and just kind of do it as if it were like an independent film, kind of like, all right, we've got half a day to figure this out. We're going to tie you to a wire up there, jump down those boxes, leap across here, run as fast as you can, slide across on your knees, and land on your mark and say your line. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And then, <laughs> you know, try to figure out desperately how to do it. But it was so much fun to learn all that physical stuff um, kind of on the fly, which was totally um, new to me. Uh, but then there's actually so much in this film that, when we were sort of tricked into feeling like we were making a small film, and it's only now that we're promoting it and talking to people, and they're saying, are you so freaked out that we realize kind of what a big thing it is? There was a lot to it that actually didn't feel uh, overwhelming and big and crazy to us. That's uh, wild yeah, for, they, for me to hear, because when I started watching the movie, within the first like 15 minutes, when you see the streets of this kind of fantastical 1930s New York and the way that David Yates kind of shoots it in all these beautiful wide shots, it looks like a massive yeah. undertaking. Well, also, I don't ever wear my contacts when I'm working, so that was probably part of it, is I couldn't really see like what Anything. a big picture it was. Um, guys, talk about how you got cast in the film and what it was like working on it. Dan, your character is someone who's trying to open a bakery, but uh, sort of accidentally stumbles into the world of the Fantastic Beasts and Newt Scamander. Yes, you don't. You really don't like yours, do you? Well, You'll see, they're all the same. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, they fixed it somehow. <laughs> Everyone was telling me it sounded terrible. It was sounding like a. Those weird... were the voices in your head. Those, Nobody said it sounded terrible. You guys, Maybe I was... a, you guys are doing a great it's, it's job better. screwing with Dan's Thank head. Thank you. It's better. <laughs> Messing with the no uh, <laughs> Yeah, man. I am. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm a. I play the baker, and. Um, should I tell that story about? I guess so. Yeah. yeah, I um, for the first audition, I I thought, you know, what does a baker look like in 1926? So I got myself like a a patchwork newsies hat and some cut off hobo gloves, some suspenders, <laughs> <laughs> and I kept that costume through the first audition, through the next audition, through um screen test until David was just like, maybe not the hat. <laughs> so I was like, really? I like, like it, no? <laughs> but he, yeah, I just felt like it was like good luck at that have point. You, you know, ever, I'm suspicious. Uh, super, have you ever dressed super, up for auditions super, before? Super Is this the only yes. time you've done it? So in the past, like, basically 80% of the time I would get the part if I, if I brought in a costume. Like the first... <laughs> And the first time was this um, Toyota commercial, and I just happened to have a, a gas attendant outfit, like a zip-up thing. <laughs> and they were like, can you bring that to the audition? <laughs> I was like, yeah. I guess I'm also uh, in the costume department. <laughs> yeah, dude. I love that. You do what you can. Hey, man, That's I, heard, I heard a story about De Niro, and that he, at, in his apartment, he didn't have any furniture when he was like, trying to get work. He just had piles of costumes. And he was just going to auditions all the time. So I was like, I thought, that sounds familiar. That's, did he have specific, not to get too far into this, but did he have specific costumes that matched each audition? Or was he just going to random auditions in like whatever costumes he had laying around? Like as a cowboy? A fireman? <laughs> I'm a cowboy. No. He, <laughs> no. No, he just had like, he was always going to thrift stores and finding like, oh, I like that. Maybe if I play this character. And, then, and he'd have these piles of clothes in his apartment. And he'd be like, okay, I got this audition. And he'd pick the perfect outfit out for that audition. Now, you two have wonderful chemistry uh, in the film. Did you know each other at all? Did you hang out at all before starting to shoot? No. No, we'd never met. No. And we shot the last scene first. first. Really? 
Yeah. What is that? What is that like? I mean, we, we can't give anything away, but like, what what was that like for you? That's a really that's a pretty important scene that requires a fair amount of emotional connection. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's something um, sort of alchemical about um, y- you know th- th- this this mysterious thing between certain people that just l- lights up when you interact with them, and um, and they were really looking for that between the four of us. Actually, and that was a big part of all the screen tests was making sure that um, just kind of standing around that we had an electricity between us. Um, and uh, I think also because, uh, at least f- for myself, that s- that was the first time that we shot anything. That was the first scene that we'd been in, and so I think that there was this real vulnerability there, and um, and and also just you know adrenaline and excitement for for starting this film, and 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 like. I actually love that we shot that. At first, I was like, "We're shooting the last scene first. This is the this is insane." Like, ah! but I'm glad that we had that because that kind of started out the the movie really beautifully in a way. That connection. I wonder if all that nervous energy that you had for shooting that last scene as well sort of fed into the emotions that you were supposed to be playing in that moment. It did, yeah. And and I think we also felt really connected with these characters already because we did a lot of work um, ahead of time to to really sort of get get an understanding of who they were and we knew what the story was and 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 we all felt really invested in this right from the get-go you know that our hearts were deeply involved in this film it's a really it's a really moving film there are a lot of really important messages in this film and and um, and I think you know, just to be a part of it, this is a real dream. You know, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's something that I certainly never thought would ever happen to me. Something this wonderful, and so, you know, you put all of that in, and you just give your character your whole heart, and then, and you hope for the best, really. Ezra, you have a lot of scenes with two pretty legendary actors, uh, Samantha Morton being the first, who's just incredible. What was it like working with her? Uh, really, really, really special. You know, um. I like to use um, sports metaphors because I don't know anything about sports. <laughs> um, so uh, what I say about like working with really good actors is like I haven't really played much tennis, but I hear that in tennis when you play it, uh, if someone is a really good tennis player, then all you have to do is put your racket where the ball is going, and it'll seem like you hit the ball really hard. So that is an apt sports metaphor that I know nothing about um, for working slam with dunk. Wor- 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 working with some. Did you call it a Sam dunk? Slam dunk. Oh, I thought you were going deep on a pun. Uh, <laughs> um, that uh, <laughs> Oh, Sam, Mo, Sam Morton. I got you. I got you. Uh, but yeah, so that's my um, uh, metaphor for for working with someone like Sam is that she is providing. She's not just delivering her performance in a way that just has an immense amount of integrity as this fully formed human being, which, you know, Mary Lou could run the risk of being really two-dimensional and just, like, uh, seeming like this um, really loathsome, abusive person. Uh, but I think Sam was really interested in in finding uh, the connection point. Um, and what about Colin Farrell? What's, what's the deal with your character's relationship with Colin Farrell's character? Yeah, what is the deal? That stuff <laughs> My is question. creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, I, I I always saw that dynamic as sort of um, that they uh, that they uh, they need things from each other. Um, Credence is in this position uh, uh, where he just desperately needs any sort of affection, acknowledgement, just human touch. I mean, there's a real hunger, and we would talk about sort of these scenes with Graves as like coming out of the desert and someone being like, "Here, I got water." in terms of like giving him recognition, giving him love, feeding him this idea that he can be a part of something greater um, than himself. Uh, and then in, in, on the flip side, uh, Graves has things that, that he really needs from Credence. And there's sort of an evolution of them questioning whether or not they're gonna be able to derive what they need from the other. And that's when, you know, uh, creepy horror ensues. <laughs> Eddie, you have a, a scene in the movie that I love that I was talking to you about in the green room, this amazing scene in the park with Dan, and you're chasing around a sort of magical kind of rhinoceros or, or elephant. Um, I, I have to ask you, what was it like shooting that, that scene? Um, 
It's a, a scene in the film in which yeah, it's it, it's a creature called an rumpant, which is a kind of mix, a magical mixture between an elephant and a rhino, and she's on heat, um, and I'm trying to entice her back into my case. And the amazing thing about J.K. Rowling is she writes this script and it's so descriptive, but occasionally she's very economical with her words. <laughs> and in this particular one, it was like so. You know, Dan's character and I were sort of running through the through Central Park Zoo, and we stumble across this thing, and then new performers mating dance, and da 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 da. And it was one of those things where you're reading the script and you keep reading, and then you sort of back up. Wait a second, new performers what? Like and and like what is a mag a magical seduction mating dance? Like what on earth? Where do you start? She wants to show us for no, don't. <laughs> no, I tr tried teaching Jimmy Fallon the other night, and it was um, oh, it was humiliating for everyone involved. So I, and I also pulled a muscle for the third time, which was um, no, but it was really weird. So I basically went down a YouTube mating hole. Really? <laughs> Gross. What did you gross. find there? <laughs> I found lots of birds doing weird cacao sounds um, to each other. And, but then I, I then worked with a choreographer and... Uh, what kind of choreographer? Um, with this woman, amazing woman called Alex Reynolds, who I'd worked with on The Theory of Everything and The Danish Girl. And she and I did some, like, did some YouTube thingies. And then basically once every week I would do a dance that she would record on her phone. And um, it, it was genuinely the most humiliating moment of the week ever. And then I would send those to David Yates, our director, but, but David cared so much that Newt's relationship with the creatures was real. Everything about Joe's world is like magical, but grounded in something authentic that I would send these videos and then I'd wait this excruciating four hours for his response. And the response would come back going, I'm not sure that what you were doing with your bum was quite seductive enough. I think that, <laughs> You know, I'm not sure that's going to entice her to roll. Can you come up with some more options? And I'll be like, yeah, okay. Uh, and anyway, so out there in the world uh, on David's phone are about 10 of the most career-ending videos imaginable. <laughs> and when you see the film, the one in the film is pretty... Blu-ray extras. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I, I have to ask, what is it? I mean, you know, when you interview people who are doing a comedy, they say, and they've, they've made a comedy film, it's hard for them because the crew can't laugh. No one can laugh while you're shooting this. You're doing something that I would imagine is only comfortable if you're, if you're getting laughter to, to feed it. So how was it for you actually doing that on set? And how long did you have to do, did you have to do that dance? I just got like super method. <laughs> I just like, got like really in the zone and tried to seduce this non-existent thing. And I knew that Dan was there being sweetly supportive. If he was laughing, he was I, I was laughing. <laughs> was, I was laughing on the inside. I think he was Very also much. laughing at the fact that I managed to pull my inner groin twice yeah. and then had to sit there with an ice pack on my inner thigh. Shake it, don't break it, Eddie. You gotta Sorry? stretch. <laughs> I know I should have stretched. Um, it was kind of no, like, like, it was like, it was kind of uh, it was kind of like, you know how James Brown, after his performance, they would like come out and like t carry him off because he was so spent, you know? <laughs> That's what it was like, man. In the movie, it's only... I felt, I felt exhausted at the end of it, but, like, in the movie, it's only on for about three seconds. And wait, and Jimmy Fallon made you do this on The Tonight Show the other night? Yeah. That guy. I don't know about that guy. Let's open it up to the audience for, for questions. Who's got some questions out there? Hi. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys, first of all, for coming. I was at the fan event last month where you guys were in London, so seeing you here in New York is pretty amazing. Um, so my question is, like, as fans of this very existent world prior to the film, what was the most interesting or the most fun aspect of the Wizarding World as you knew it that you got to see come to life, like, on this set or during the filming process? Well, they had, um, they had, everybody keeps asking if we were just stuck with a lot of green screen, and, and, and it wasn't the case at all. We had these amazing sets that are designed by the same folks, so they're equally as extraordinary and interesting. But what was really cool is that um, they had they had bits of puppetry and moving magic within them. So there was like a like a wand cleaner um, that would that would go that that has feathers and it would um, it was just amazing looking or like um, an elevator that I actually got to ride. And I don't know. Did you guys ride it? Yeah, you ride it, too. Um, or in in uh, Tina and Queenie's apartment, there's there um, there's like a sort of washing line in front of the fire, like um, I don't know what would you what would you call that? Like it's not a line, it's a like rack? A, a rack kind of thing. But 
But um, I was practicing doing the cooking and wasn't paying attention to anything except where, you know, where the potato was going. And then I turn around and the, uh, the rack was moving because the puppeteers were practicing. And it was just like, oh my God, we're actually, we're in, uh, we're in the potter. First. The amazing like thing about that was that the puppeteers, it was all attached to wires and they were way up above the space we were in. So if you looked around at eye level, you couldn't see how no it was idea. moving. So it really did look how it looks in the film to us. Like, uh, like magic. Like magic. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi, it's so great to see you all. Um, I'm very happy to see this movie and I've probably seen like every Ezra Miller movie. <laughs> Um, I really wanted to know what was the most fantastic part about being a part of this project and also what advice do you have for performers about playing it realistically under magical circumstances? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, more <laughs> the more grounded, the better, I guess, you know, when you're, when they're in those circumstances. Um, yeah, what was the most, the first part of it was what was the most fantastic? fantastic. The beasts, sorry. <laughs> well, and where they were. Um, <laughs> no, I would say the most, the miracle, uh, this was a miracle for me. This, I wished for this to happen. I was in a place in my acting career where I was like, I need a miracle. I got, I got to put food on the table, I got two kids. You know, and uh, here it is. And it's, and for any actor, oh God, just hold on in the universe and, and if your ten intentions are good. Fairy tales can come true. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to feel that or? I, I think what Dan was saying about about as far as how you approach the fantastic is is in the same way that J.K. Rowling does in what she writes. She she creates this parallel universe of wonder and um, imagination, but it is so her characters are so grounded in a truth, and that that's why we all fall for them because it's as if this this world is happening coinciding. These wizards and witches can be brushing past us and. Eddie Redmayne touched me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 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 continue. Um, uh, now I go be true. Uh, <laughs> I hate myself. Um, good, yes, so keep it, keep it real and authentic. <laughs> We're still drunk. <laughs> Finally, somebody says night. it. <laughs> Next uh, question. Hi, um, so my question is, I guess, a little more on the fun side. I've always heard about actors maybe keeping souvenirs or something from uh, I don't know if this role or another role you've had, so any favorite souvenirs you've kept or why you kept them, stories behind that. Did you keep your case, your new case? Uh, no, I was not allowed to keep the case, <laughs> although I'm really, although I, I now have so they, Funko Pop, who make these like characters of our things. I've got, I've got several Funko Pop nifflers, which I'm quite excited about. <laughs> I just sit at home, I'm gonna start collecting like ceramic nifflers. Nifflers are one of the creatures in the film. I took a couple pairs of my 1920s underwear. And that, <laughs> And that's being true. real. That's yeah. That's what I took. Because because remember last time I talked about this, I remember what happened. We were at Comic Con. No. And I called it and I called it, which I still think is one way you could refer to it as period underwear. Oh, oh right. yeah. Like that's not what that is. That's, that's, that's something right. else. That's not okay. No. Yeah, back off. <laughs> um, but what I meant at that time, I've been, I've been just looking for the moment to clarify, I meant underwear from the 1920s. My pajamas. But it's also big and, you know, it's also like very, very long, down to the knees. Roomy? Very, very. Your undies went down to your knees? Yeah, the, the 1920s underwear were like buttons and like, they were like shorts. They're like linen shorts, very nice, very soft. <laughs> Holly Natwood. If you're watching this, I'm sorry. I did, in fact, take two pairs of that underwear that was in my trailer. Busted. Took it on the last day. I meant to take my pajamas, but I forgot. And Colleen copied a pair of vintage pajamas that I own to make them. Wow. Ooh. And so I really, yeah, I messed up there. And I was watching the movie last night. And I was like, damn, I meant to take the PJs. 
but maybe where do they exist now? I meant I think to take your PJs storage. too. You actually. wanted my PJs? I also wanted your PJs. I had sister envy. I was like, what's she got? They had tiny little zebras I, all over them. I don't even think so you cool. can see the detail in the movie, but I knew it. I think we have time for one more question. Hello, everybody. Um, if you could step out of the shoes of your character and into the shoes of someone else in the film, who would it be and why? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so many choices. I want to be Narlac. Whoa. Run things goblin style. <laughs> um, here it feels good to be a goblin gangster. I would want to be Madame Pickery, <laughs> president of the Makusa. <laughs> you just like hats. I like the hat she has, yes. I think I'd like to be the Niffler. I was going to say that. Soul yeah. sister. <laughs> Watch, so you could just they get your hands on lots of shiny it. things. You yeah. could raid jewelry stores all the time. It's the sass. Yeah. Oh, right, the, the sass. sass. Yeah. yeah, I'd want to be picket so that I could just like hug things all day and just hang out in oh, someone's you, pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hang out in your own pocket. <laughs> hang out in my own pocket. <laughs> um, guys, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them comes out next Friday, right? November 18th. November 18th. It's so fantastic, obviously. It's really wonderful, a delightful film. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. For having us.